I don't, there are a couple of days when you show up to church and you kind of know where the preacher's going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, next week, yeah, we're talking about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And this week we're going to talk about that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Or on Christmas, we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus. This sometimes just match up, right? Mm -hmm. And the preacher would be remiss not to be in those passages. I got to tell you, I am happy that our Sunday school material has finally moved. I mean, for the longest time, they would be, on those days, they would be teaching in Sunday school while I was going to preach. That made it difficult. Yeah. Sure, you had some of those times, though. Yeah. But now we were in Thessalonians learning great stuff for that. So we're going to start, this story actually shows up in all four Gospels. And you got to figure, if it's showing up in all four Gospels, it's a pretty important thing. We're going to use the passage out of John, though, today. And John 12, starting in the 12th verse. It says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. That's pretty cool. I want you to look at the wording here, though. Because I think words are matter. The, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming. And so many times I've read through that and not thought about it much. But the Jews that lived in Jerusalem, they didn't come to the feast, they lived there. So these people are the ones that lived out in the other areas that had gathered to Jerusalem for the feast. Some of the material I read said there could be upwards of 3 million Jews at one time hanging out in Jerusalem and there was outer parts to, for that feast. It was so huge of a time. So many people. Just floods and floods of people coming into <coughs> Jerusalem. Because the Passover is one of those days, if you're a Jew, you've got to be in Jerusalem. So Jesus is coming. And who runs out to greet him but the people from the outskirts? Did you ever think about that? Not, now, who would be, I know this is a loaded question, who would be the most holy people in Jerusalem, in, uh, of Jews? I would be the ones that live right there where the temple is, right? In theory. Who would really want to welcome the king in? The people that live right there. They should be looking for him and ready. But it's the visitors that went out there. It was the country folk that went out there. And you know what? They had heard about Jesus. They had, you know, this is on the heels of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. You tell me that word got to Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you. We actually have biblical evidence of that. That the Jewish leaders were actually kicking that around. That was just a, a horrible event for them. For Jesus to go raise somebody out of the grave. But people heard. And they gathered. And they just thronged out there. And the same way we would roll out the red carpet for important people and stuff like that. They threw stuff on the ground. They threw the palm branches down, because it was a common thing. They, they took branches off of olive trees and threw them down. They took their own coats off and threw them down to pave the way for the king. 1450. It says, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. All right. Now, this is kind of important in, in, in several ways. And you might look at some of the other texts and the other Gospels, and they tell you a little bit more of a story about how he got the donkey. That in and of itself is a pretty cool thing. But he's fulfilling scripture. He's fulfilling a prophecy just by riding in on a donkey. But think about this. If you break this down, the king had options for when he rode into town. The king could ride into town on a horse, on a powerful 
horse that would be used to pull a chariot or to go to war. And a man of war and a soldier type of king, he would come in like that. If he was coming in to do battle, he would come in on a horse. If he was coming in to show his power, he would come in on this powerful animal. But if he's a king who's coming in peace, he comes in on a donkey. So how does Jesus come in? But on a donkey. And even they call him the king of peace. And even among donkeys, he comes in on a young. There was no show of power. There was no demonstration of strength. It's just the king coming into town. And in that moment, those people recognized that. The visitors, the people from the outskirts, the country folk. While the city folk, if you just read on and go through the story, uh, some of the city folk, they're, they're all upset about it. Why are these people, they got so into shouting this that even when Jesus made it into town, they were still kind of wandering around town shouting it, you know? It just was this thing, and it worried the leaders. It worried the, the good Jews in the town. They even told Jesus, hey, you should tell these people to hush up. Verses 6 and 17. Because the disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. So I want to go back and look at the beginning of the story. You know, we have the, the people on the outside that came as soon as they heard Jesus was coming. And they're shouting, and they're calling him king, and they're welcoming him as the king of peace. And then you have Jews in the town that probably couldn't care, or were upset about the whole thing. Oh, what is that, well, all that fuss about? It. Oh, it's that, that troublemaker Jesus coming into town. Both would call themselves Jews. Both would call themselves believers in God. But only one set truly believed. And as the week wore on, this is a big week, historically. I mean, he comes into town on, on Sunday. And it isn't too long before he goes to the temple and just makes a fuss. Because that's his house, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer, and it wasn't. He sets some things straight. He has the Last Supper with his disciples. He washes their feet. He's betrayed by a kiss. He's questioned and beaten and questioned and beaten and mocked. And he dies on a cross on Friday when he's buried. And when we meet again on Sunday, we're going to celebrate his resurrection. It's a busy week. And we're going to see all kinds of believers in that week. I'm, I'm thinking it's the visitors, it's the country folk that welcomed him in, but it's the people in town that were screaming for him to be crucified. Both would say they were Jews. Both would say they were believers. What kind of believers are we? Did you know that there are people who would claim to be Catholics because they were raised in a Catholic home? Maybe mom and dad drug them to the church and stuff like that. And it's a traditional thing, and they are Catholic because mom and dad were Catholic. Some people think they're Christians because mom and dad are Christians. Some people are Jews because mom and dad are Jews. It's a thing of heritage. It's not a thing of practice. It's not really a thing of the soul. There are all kinds of believers and all kinds of stuff out there. But what matters is to be a believer in Jesus as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Savior of our souls. Amen. That's the belief that matters. And that belief will drive us to do things differently than other people. It's not like we have to work at looking different than others. Really all we have to do is think about who we believe in. Do I believe that Jesus has the answers for my life? Do I believe that his word speaks about what I need to do? 
or do I think I've got all the answers? And his word is something I just look to when I have some troubles now. We have to be careful what kind of believer we are. Another thing to think about is who's your king. The Old Testament said your king is coming. They recognized the king was coming. Who is your king? When you're talking to somebody else, who is their king? Recognize this in somebody. i got to tell you, Jesus is my king. He influences the decisions that I make, the jobs that I take, the places that I preach. You know, I'm here because God called me here. And that's just a plain and simple thing. He put it on my heart. There was nothing else on my heart to do. He, he wanted me, I needed to be here. When I met with your committee, some of you are still here. When I met with that committee, you guys agreed. And we started a journey that's just been running for a while. I'm loving it. I, I tell my friends in town, they haven't kicked me out yet. I'm very happy. <laughs> but Jesus is my king. When, they, when I was ordained, one of the people on the ordination council, he asked me, because after all the tough questions, he's like, so if we don't ordain you today, that's a question you want to hear, right? So if we don't ordain you today, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to preach. You know, <coughs> you guys, I, I love you and you have the authority to ordain me or not, but God has called me to preach. And I'm going to preach. Right. You guys can get with it and behind me or, or not. That's up to you. Uh, tell me I need to wait a while to get your blessing. That's cool. I'm going to go preach somewhere else while I'm waiting. That's just how it is. Uh, Doc knows what I'm talking about. There's nothing else you can do if you're called to preach. You've got to preach. I, I've talked to other people that are thinking about ministry here or there, getting a toe in it or whatever. And I'm like, if you can do anything else, go do it. Because if you were really called, you can't do anything else. And you'll know. <clears throat> These guys recognized their king and called him that. I know I'm not my king. I serve somebody greater than me. And the honest truth is everybody serves somebody greater than them. It just depends on who your king is. Now, then we talked about these guys just would not shut up. They were witnesses. At the bottom of this, it said, the people that were there that watched Lazarus get raised from the grave, they continued to bear witness. Now, you think this, yeah, of course they did. They watched a dead guy come out of the tomb. And he didn't even smell. It was pretty awesome. But the thing is, you could end up dead doing this. The Jews, the leading Jews in town, were not happy about this at all. As a matter of fact, they would have been happy to kill Lazarus and get done with the story. They'd have been happy to kill Jesus if they could. And eventually they did. But it didn't matter. They were witnesses. They were going to testify to what they saw. Now I have not seen the dead rise yet. I haven't with my own eyes. I definitely believe the story. But I haven't seen it. And I've seen the sick healing. I've seen the, the dead in soul and spirit be raised to life in Jesus. Amen. I've watched that transformation in people. And that is as real as anything I've experienced in my life. <clears throat> you don't need to use somebody else's witness. You don't have to learn a witness. You are a witness. What has Jesus done in your life to you, with you, through you? Tell people. It's just like that. That somebody went to a softball game recently. I think, from what I recall, it might have been her first softball game, college game. She got over there. <laughs> she had her first one. I'm guessing the Hogs were playing. And you know what? Did you tell anybody? Did you tell anybody you were going to a softball game? But you went to your first softball game? You didn't? Man, I would tell everybody. <laughs> I mean, I've been to a few, but I, I, I would love that. You know, those first events, 
How about if you got to go to a Super Bowl and sit on the 50-yard line? Would you tell your friends? Yeah. You'd rub it in their face, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> As, as easily as that. Man, I tell people unashamedly, I'm an OU fan. Hey, I love the Hogs too, and thankfully they don't compete all that often against each other. It's coming though. But I, I tell anybody, when I go home or, or back to Oklahoma, I tell them I love the Hogs too. I'm open about it. But you know what? Even better than the Hogs and the Sooners, I love Jesus. And I'm okay with telling anybody about that. You know, I don't slap at people around about it, but if you got to know me, you need to know that. I love Jesus. That's the kind of witness we need to be. Not perfect. Hey, a lot of people see your flaws sometimes. Be real. Let them see your Jesus too. And verse 18 says this. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was they heard he had done this sign. They heard about the resurrection of Lazarus. It's why they went out there. How did they hear about the resurrection of Lazarus? There was not an internet. There was no CNN. I don't know if they cover it anyway. But it wasn't there. <laughs> but there were people there. And those people went to Jerusalem. Those people went to the countryside. And everybody was talking about it. That Jesus raised somebody from the dead. So that when Jesus showed up, everybody wanted to go see him. Or at least all these people that were believers. And they knew the king was coming. They looked for Jesus because of what they heard about. The people in your life. And that could be friends, family, people you pass on the street. The people in your life may only hear about Jesus if you say so. And like I said, you don't have to full on throw this full court press on them about salvation. Just let them see Jesus in you and know about God's love through you and then they might, they might be asking you questions. As they see God help to feed them. To let them know when they're ready to see, you're ready to tell. You don't have to force feed people. If God is at work in their heart, then There'll be a match there. But let them see Jesus in you first. Man. Through tough parts, through easy parts, all of it. When you're hurting, let them see you hurt sometimes. But let them see you hurt knowing you have a hope. Man, we, we, we don't miss out on suffering. We get to suffer like everybody else. Except we have hope through the suffering. That's the most important thing. And it's something we can give others. is hope. That's why I want to ask you to pray just for a minute. Just talk to God about some of these things.